Hi, everybody. I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And this is an InterNACHI webinar. We do free, live, online, open to everyone classes, webinars. And it's all about home inspections, performing a home inspection, getting trained and certified, business, marketing, networking, all that good stuff. We got to learn how to inspect homes well. And um, this is a free live training class called Home Inspection Training Class number 45. And we're going to inspect this house. I inspected this house and I wrote an inspection report. So let's inspect this house. Now, if you're attending it live, uh, feel free to chat with everyone. And if you wanted to ask a question, there's a Q&A feature as well. And so we'll get to that. If you have never been a member of InterNACHI, InterNACHI, world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. And if you want to be a member of InterNACHI, there are a lot of membership benefits, um, great reasons to join. And if you've never been one and you want to join for free and try us out, um, I have a free one-month membership. Visit nachi.org, nachi, N-A-C-H-I dot org slash trial, T-R-I-A-L, and enter the code webinar month. If you wanted to get a, a discount off of your first year of membership at InterNACHI, go to that same URL, nachi.org slash trial, and use the coupon code webinar. Inside the organization of InterNACHI, there is a home inspector college. It's the only home inspector college on the planet. It's at internachi.edu. And you know it's an accredited school when you see the .edu. So if you're a home inspector, commercial property inspector, mold inspector, roof inspector, and you are figuring, trying to figure out where to go to get your training and certification and examination or continuing education, don't go to an unaccredited school. Find one that has a .edu. And InterNACHI is open for InterNACHI members, and it's a tuition-free online home inspector college at internachi.edu. If you're interested in home inspection business and marketing, made simple, we have a resource for you. I made a playlist of videos short little videos about home inspection business and marketing, and I tried to simplify things. So go to nachi.org slash simple. And uh, instead of watching your favorite Netflix TV show, go to nachi.org slash simple and um, learn some business and marketing strategies. And once you are a home inspector, you got to get online. So get your business online with a new custom website at an affordable price from InterNACHI's official vendor for website designs, inspectorwebsitebuilder.com. Inspector Website Builder, InterNACHI's official vendor, that means they only design websites for home inspectors at InterNACHI. So you have to be a member of InterNACHI. You don't have to be a certified inspector, just a member of InterNACHI and they can start working on your website. They design all of the websites for all of our members. So go to nachi.org slash website or visit Inspector Website Builder or just Google search it. Inspector Website Builder to get a custom modern website for your home inspection business. And that includes SEO. All right, let's inspect this house. And that's my truck. My client wasn't showing up to the inspection. I knew that ahead of time. If they were showing up, I would never park in the driveway. I let my clients park in the driveway. But since no one was showing up, I'm going to park in the driveway. And that's me with my big tall ladders and my inspection van and getting ready to do an inspection at this house. And it took me about two and a half hours to inspect this house. Now, during this training class, we can talk about anything you want. We're going to inspect the house. We're going to conduct a home inspection according to the home inspection standards of practice. 
That's really important. That's how I did my inspections. We're going to learn how the home works. We're going to find problems. There are problems at this house. We're going to follow the standards of practice. We can talk about using inspection software. I have software on my phone so that it's mobile and I'm efficient with my time because I write the inspection report while I inspect. We're going to read the inspection report that I wrote and we're going to learn, not lean, we're going to learn how to get certified and trained as a home inspector, but also in additional inspection services, because that's where the gross revenue is. The gross revenue is in performing as many inspections for your client in a bundle at the same time. So I made $1,000 a day, about five or $600 per inspection. My home inspection was $400, $396. But at every home inspection, I tried to sell an additional type of inspection, a mold inspection, radon inspection, a wood destroying organism inspection, something else bundled with it. And every inspector had that goal at the company. So when they came back to the office, they had $1,000 gross revenue. We could talk about business and marketing. Feel free to ask questions. Okay. And it's video recorded so you can watch later. Steve says he has an inspection that came up. Is it possible to watch this this evening? Yes, Steve. All Internet G webinars are video recorded so you can watch it later. But yep, if anybody has a, a phone call to convert a website visitor into a scheduled client, please take that call. Here's my morning schedule. I wanted to share it with you um, so that you can compare what you do with what I do, right? This isn't uh, written in stone. Um, we're all different inspectors. Um, we all get up different times. Um, but this is the schedule that I had in order to make about $500 before lunch. And so I wanted to share that with you. So it's 7 a.m., get up early, and I leave the house, 7, 7.30, depending on the location of the home. I try not to drive more than 20 miles away. So there's a radius, literally a, a map. You got to think about where your zip codes are. What service area do you do? You don't drive really far out. You want to stick close in your market area. You know, you want to concentrate on your market area so that you're not spending a lot of time traveling because, well, unless you've figured out how to get paid for your travel time, which I did, they should pay you as you drive. You know, if you're driving two hours, hmm, that's going to be difficult to be competitive with your pricing if you have to drive and get paid for driving. Plus, you just don't want to waste your time. So the idea about marketing is to target your area, have a little niche or area, a zip code, a zone, in which you dominate. So at 7 a.m., leave the house. 8 a.m., my inspection starts. The clients can show up at any time after that. Ideally, they would show up at 8, but I'm getting there early because where I'm from, if you're on time, you're late. So you get there early. And what do I do when I get there early and I pull up into the driveway if my client's not showing up? I do the roof. I do something. I organize my tools, get them set up, bring all my tools. I've got my tool bag here. Bring all my tools to the front door, set up my ladder if I'm going up on the roof. And I do the roof inspection because I don't want my client with me on the roof. That's one system. There may be others, but for sure, the roof inspection is just me and me alone or another inspector, helper. I don't bring my client up on the roof. And I have to really concentrate when I'm doing the roof inspection. I can't really talk down, you know, I'll be on the roof and they'll be on the ground. Talk, I'm not gonna do that. I need to really concentrate 
watch my steps because it's dangerous to get up on the roof. But I'm going to do the roof inspection. And you're not required to walk upon any roof according to InterNACHI standards of practice. So at 815, that's the heavy lifting. Those are all the systems that are mm, challenging. It's HVAC. It's plumbing supply. It's drain waste vent. It's the water source, a hot water source, the water heater, and then electrical and structure. That's going to be about mm, almost two hours, an hour and a half of my time. Those are the heavy systems. I call them heavy systems. They're just a lot of concentration, a lot of work, a lot of components to move through. And that's why I have mobile software on my phone so that I can inspect and write the report as I inspect. I don't want to write at night or in the afternoon, in the evening after dinner. When I'm done with this inspection by 12 o'clock, really 11 o'clock, I'll be done with the inspection and the report will be written. And I'll have $500 in my pocket. Being a home inspector, well, it's a lot of fun because you can make a great living doing this. And you get to teach essentially your neighbors how their home works, how to maintain it, and how to save home energy. That's an important issue. At 10 o'clock, if I start at 8 o'clock, at 10 o'clock, two hours in, I need to be in the attic. I'm managing my time. If I'm in the attic two hours or so after I inspect, I know that I'm being efficient with my time. I know that things are going well. I know that I can get to my next job on time. Everything is going well. I'm managing my time and I'm managing my clients and I'm managing the software. It's really important. You can't just start a home inspection and see how it goes. Almost every minute you are counting, every five minutes that pass by, you know where you're 10 minutes, every quarter hour, every, every hour. At 10 o'clock, I know I've got to be in the attic. 10.15, well, now I'm doing the interior and the bathrooms, garage if it's there, attached garage or detached, and I'm going to head to the kitchen. I'm heading to the kitchen. I'm ending in the kitchen. I want to end everything three hours later in the kitchen with a summarizing of the of my observations and maybe read out or print out the summary of the report. So the interior is really, when I'm doing the interior, I'm all smiles because I'm heading to the kitchen. And I'll do the interior 15 minutes max. Bathrooms, if there's one bathroom is maybe five minutes, 10 at most, if there's a problem. So I'm really moving through the interior, the bathrooms, the garage, and then getting to the kitchen, doing the appliances and wrapping everything up, and then getting paid only after my client is satisfied. I've walked my client through. I've educated them on their home, how everything works, where everything is located, like the air filter or the main water shutoff valve, for example. And I've told them how to maintain it. And if there's a problem, I've described the problem, described what would happen if we don't fix the problem and who should fix it. A licensed plumber, maybe a contractor, a roofer. I give them overwhelming amount of information within a limited amount of time. And that is essentially our job. We're trained, certified, we're knowledgeable, we have a skill set in order to educate. You are essentially educators. And unlike any other professor or educator or teacher, you are a, um, a, a master at this because you have to walk and talk at the same time. And every classroom that you're in is completely different. Every hands-on classroom that you take your students through is a different house, is a different setting, completely different. Well, they're similar from one to the next, but just a, a, so much fun to be a home inspector and to be essentially an educator. You're also a storyteller. At the end of your three-hour, four-hour inspection, you've told the story of the home. 
So what if there's a big hole in the roof? That's part of the story. You're not there to kill a deal. You're not there to destroy a real estate transaction. You're not there to ruin someone's day of buying their dream home. There's hardly anything that I could do within the next three hours to stop somebody from buying their dream home. Because I'm just telling the story of the home. And if there's a problem, well, I'll, I'll tell that story. And, that's, and it's got to be fixed either by my clients that I'm educating or the seller or the, the, the contractor or the property maintenance crew or something like that. And it's just a story that you're telling. And you're educating too. Well, back to my morning. This is my $500 morning. And if I do two inspections, my next one's starting at 12. And I can drive from 11 to 12 because I finish up at 11, right? And I'm driving to my next job and eating lunch at the same time. Maybe I'll pull over if I can. And I'll have a breath mint, a new shirt, and I'm ready to go for my second job. Do the same thing. And then I'm coming back to the office or back home with about a thousand bucks, a thousand dollars a day. I mean, just this is a great Saturday morning, making $500. When's the last time you made $500 on a Saturday morning? Being a home inspector is really fun. And being helping your neighbors with their homes, that's really, it's really valuable. I'm taking a look at the questions. John says, if you're a current member, yep, the, the, um, the offers for discounts for the trial, one month trial membership is, is just a free one month membership um, for people who have never been a home inspector, uh, internet team member. How would you suggest finding a company to work for as a CPI if we aren't really ready to start on our own? Good question. Um, Heather. Um, so there's two things. There's internet. You can help the home inspector who wants to be on her own, owning her own home inspection company. And we can also help her be a valuable home inspector, contractor, or employee for a company. And we do both. Internet G does both. Internet G will give you the resources so that you can be a valuable employee or a contractor to be hired, or you can run your own business. We have all the resources you need to do either one. So become trained and certified. That's obvious. You need to be a trained and certified home inspector. And then you really should, before you even approach the idea of running your own business, or conducting a home inspection for a client, or offering your services as a certified home inspector to a potential employee, you need to perform about 20 inspections on your own. You need to crash and burn on your own. You need to be skilled in using software because they're basically all the same. I prefer a particular software that's really good, but you know, if you get the idea of using software in order to document your observations. So you have to learn how to inspect and write report software. And I would do that on my own home. So before you do a home inspection for a client as your own, as a business owner, or before you offer your services to a potential employer, be skilled as much as possible by inspecting your own home at least 10 times. If you're into this, if you're really into it, you do not play video games. You do not have a Netflix show tonight. You're going to inspect your kitchen twice tonight. If you're really into this, and I am, I would inspect my kitchen. Let's say you don't have software. Download InterNACHI's inspection checklist. You can use a pencil and paper. It's just for practice, right? You're practicing. See how efficiently. I'm not saying run through the appliances as fast as possible and skip some stuff. I'm saying be efficient, inspect everything, but be efficient with your time, manage your time. Like my morning um, itinerary agenda, my morning time starting at seven, 
ending at 11. You have to be efficient with your inspection of a system. I just pick a kitchen. You can pick a bathroom. Tonight, inspect your bathroom twice. See how more efficient you are the second time through. You seem to be just faster and better. You seem to find the things on your mobile software with your thumb faster when you do it the second time or the third time. And that's how you should be before you conduct a home inspection for a real client or offer your services to an employer. You should be skilled and experienced as much as possible. And that's just on your own homes. Next, after you inspect your own, own home for 10 times, you go to your neighbor and they know who you are already, right? Because you've been telling everybody in your neighborhood that you're a home inspector and you want to inspect their home for free. You don't have to worry about contracts or anything. You're just doing it for free, out of courtesy, right? And um, it's not, a not for a client, just your friends, your neighbor's home and you're getting experience and you're developing a skill set. And then at the end of the inspection, you're gonna inform your client, your neighbor, your friend, your family member, your coworker, whoever you do the free inspections for in order to get skills. You're gonna inform them how their home works, how to maintain it, if there are any problems, what the problems are and how to fix it and who should fix them. And InterNACHI trains you on all of that. You'll be able to do all of that because we're a, an actual accredited college for home inspectors. We can teach you how to perform that type of inspection and provide that type of information for your neighbor. You inspect as many neighbors' homes as possible. And you get Google reviews. You should have a website. Remember, inspectorwebsitebuilder.com. InterNACHI's vendor for a website. Get a Google business profile and ask them to write reviews for you. Sure, make sure you do a really good inspection form. Get five-star reviews. Now you're getting Google reviews before, for performing inspections, developing a skill set, even before you conduct an actual inspection for a fee-paying client or offer your services to another home inspection company. You have a lot to learn and you might as well, I call it crash and burn on your own before you are of any value to anybody. You're of no value to anyone if you don't have any experience inspecting homes. So inspect homes, get to it, inspect your house. If you live in an apartment, inspect your apartment, condominium. Inspect your house 10 times. Then inspect your neighbor's home. Because remember that service market area? Everybody in that area, within reach of your home, all your neighbors, in your apartment building, above and below, everywhere, should know that you're a home inspector and you can help them. Whenever there's a weather event in my neighborhood, they know I can find water problems. How can I find water problems? Because I got this. Got my tools. Got my infrared, got my moisture meter. Right? You need an infrared camera, moisture. And then start inspecting homes. Okay, that was a good question. I've gone off the rails a little bit, right? We should go back. Uh, so good question, Heather. Joe, does InterNACHI have a list of multi-inspection? Yes, we do. Um, contact member services. Um, we're on the contact page. Contact member services and ask about multi-inspection firms. There's also a, a forum. If you wanted to get hired, we have a, an online message board forum thread. Um, it's a classified ads. Essentially, you, you just post, hey, I'm looking to work with someone. Uh, is a license required in California to perform WDO inspections? Um, no. Um, it is a licensed professional called a WDO pesticide applicator. 
But in California, if you're doing visual inspections and you are not identifying the bug, you're not identifying the actual, like an entomologist, I think they're called, like an actual termite, not identify. But if you are a home inspector in California and you run across something that's damaging wood, let's say, that could be water, mold, fungus, or bugs. Yeah. I'm going to identify damage, wood destroying organisms, insects, but I'm not going to identify the actual bug or termite or beetle or bee. You're just performing a home inspection and observing something that is damaging wood. And you're not spraying pesticides. And you are recommending further evaluation from a licensed pesticide applicator, right? So take a look at that. Um, I can also hook you up with somebody from the California Department of Agriculture who can comment on that for you. Uh, or just do it yourself. You know, I'm a home inspector in California. I perform home inspections and I look for anything that damages wood, including insects. Would it be okay if I inform my clients about WD, uh, wood destroying, uh, things that destroy wood without identifying the actual insect, WDEI, wood destroying insect. And also I recommend that uh, if I do find something that a licensed pesticide applicator further evaluate. Yeah, why don't you... Jose, why don't you um, contact the California Department of Agriculture? It's a very common thing. Um, Let's see, Sean asked, does the website builder have software to accept payments and sign contracts from clients? Yes, um, there's, a, there's a, a credit card application payment process, right? To accept payments, uh, it's so fantastic. When you have clients with credit cards, they just swipe it and it's fantastic. So um, you can do a little swiper thing, it's very easy, or you can integrate something on your website where you, know, you have a portal just for clients and they can, that usually my clients give me, remember at 11 o'clock, they're giving me my credit card. So I just swipe and it's connected. It's not really connected to my website. But if, if you say things like to your clients, well, go to my website and log in to pay me. Why don't you just ask for the credit card, right? Just in person or on the phone, right? You don't need really a website, but you can integrate. What, what you really are thinking about, what's more important, 100 times more important than that is scheduling right? You want a scheduling widget, they call it. They call it so that your website is scheduling home inspections for you. You put a calendar, you put your services there, your fees, your calendar, and a way for somebody to visit your website and schedule an inspection with you. Why? Why is that more important? Because when you're performing an inspection, at the end of the inspection, you collect your money. And that's where you collect your money at the end of the inspection, right? Or you can send out an email with a link or something like that to a, a client that didn't show up. That's very easy. Uh, think of a website as an employee that you pay no more than $20, $30 a month for hosting to work for you 24-7 in trying to convert everyone that visits your website into a scheduled client. You want to schedule clients. Accepting payments is easy. The hard part is to get total strangers to schedule an inspection with you. That is the ultimate brutal goal of every website. That's why InterNACHI's official, uh, official vendor for website designs is so good at it. All of it is designed for that purpose, to convert that website visitor into a scheduled client. That's what you want. Think of your website as some, someone in your company who's working 24 seven while you're sleeping or while you're doing an inspection, they're trying to get a total stranger to schedule an inspection with you. That's the whole point of a website. 20 years ago, 30 years or 40 years ago, the whole purpose of a website was to educate people about what is a home inspection. You know, some of the, some of the old timers still have that on the website. Like what is a home inspection? We don't do that anymore. The whole purpose of a home inspection website design is to convert website visitors into scheduled clients. 
Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So I would get more information from InterNACHI's vendor by visiting inspectorwebsitebuilder.com. Inspector Builder. Google that. Um, and, and the signed contracts, that's easy. That's another embed. So you embed your scheduler on your website and you embed signed contracts on your website. You don't have to do an embedding of your contracts. You know, again, it's not really where you put that. Your website is all about scheduling clients. Getting payments is by email or in person. And um, signing a contract is the thing you do before you perform a home inspection and it's by email. And I have software, inspection report software that does both, right? I can manage that. I integrate InterNACHI's online agreement system with my software. And um, Inspector Website Builder does all that for you. They'll, they'll explain it better than I do. What is the link on InterNACHI where you can put your services for other home inspectors? Um, contact member services. It's on our forum. There's a particular thread. It's called classified. You can find it yourself. Go to the forum, natchi.org slash forum, and um, scroll down and look for the classified thread or just call member services. Don't call. Email, because they're going to reply with a link and you can't do links over the phone. Good questions, Dan. Awesome. Okay. Let's get back to um, performing an inspection. Okay. How do I perform an inspection and make $1,000 a day without making any mistakes? <laughs> That's essentially what you want to know, right? How do you make a great living being a home inspector? Where do you begin? Well, there's so much to inspect. Wish I had like a checklist. You do. It's the standards of practice. The standards of practice is the foundation upon which your entire home inspection service is built. It tells you what to do and what you don't have to do. It tells you what to inspect and what you don't have to inspect. It tells you what you're responsible for and what you're not responsible for, right? So go to natchiorg slash SOP. That's the home inspection standards of practice. And the first section in the SOP is the roof. And that is why I do the roof first. I show up early at my home inspection and I do the roof inspection according to the home inspection standards of practice. And by the time I get down from my ladder, I'm done inspecting the roof system and all of its components. And I'm done writing the inspection report for that system and all the components. And I'm meeting my client in the driveway. Big smile, first impression. And that system is done. And I'm on time because I'm managing my time. And me and my client are going to have so much fun. We're going to walk through the home if they want to. Ideally, my clients walk with me because I'm an educator. I'm a storyteller of the home. I want, to hear the, I want them to hear the story. I want to educate them about their home. It's a great two-hour adventure. And so the next system would be exterior. But right now, I'm doing the roof. And you are not required to do this. This is not safe if you're not trained and skilled in it. Walking upon the roof is not required. It's not necessary, actually. It's not recommended. It's not a safe thing. But I do it. A lot of inspectors do it. A lot of inspectors use drones. Some inspectors hire other inspectors to go up on the roof. Some inspectors hire roofers to go up on the roof. But I love pictures like this. This shows my client that I get up close and personal with the roof system. I'm there. I'm walking on the roof. Now, if you and I are competing, right? Remember that market service area that we talked about earlier? What if there's me and you in that area? Or maybe there's two circles and they kind of overlap, right? And we're competing. We're friendly competitors. How are you going to compete with me in your marketing when I go up on the roof and you don't? Hmm. See, in my perspective, the value that I provide my client in going up on the roof is overwhelmingly good. 
in relation to the cost. See, in business, there's this equation that I like. It's, it's well, there, there's a general rule of thumb, let's call it. And the general rule of thumb in business, if you want to be successful, is that the perceived value that you provide to your client must be overwhelming in relation to the cost. So if you can overwhelm your client with value or perceived value, they, they, seem to, they seem to see a lot of value in what you're providing. What do you provide? You're educating your home, you're educating your clients about their home. You're telling the story of their home. You're finding problems, describing those problems, documenting them, recommending how to fix them and by whom. You're doing all that great education in a short amount of time for a certain price. And if that's incredibly overwhelmingly valuable to your clients, your potential clients, in relation to the cost, then it's a good decision. If the perceived value is overwhelmingly good in relation to the cost, then it's a good decision. And that goes true with just about everything, right? Like. There's a burger restaurant in town and the, the burger is $20. It's a $20 cheeseburger. Now, if I perceive that burger to be of incredible, overwhelming value, I'm going to pay. I don't care what it is. I'm going to pay that 20 bucks for that burger, right? That's how you should be. You should be the best burger in town. You should have. You should be thinking about being the best burger in town. How can you provide incredible value? This is one way that we did incredible value. We provided incredible value to our clients because we got up on every roof that we could. There's another picture of us up on the roof. And if you don't get up on the roof, that's okay. There are other ways to compete. So let's see. I have a question for you. Let's see if I can do a question. Now, if it's live, you should be able to see this question. The question is, are you required to walk on the roof? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Are you required to walk upon the roof? So we'll give five more seconds. Come on, everyone participate. Five, four, three, two, what? No, don't chat it. You should be, oh, maybe you can't see the, there's, there should be a poll on, on your side. Um, maybe you can't see it. And I'm going to end the poll. Everyone is voting. Awesome. End the poll. And I'll, I'll share the results. So the results are, yeah, all of you got the right answer, actually you are not required to walk upon the roof. That's awesome. Good job. Good job with taking the poll. I like asking questions. So what do I do? I inspect every plane, every surface, every roofing material. I try to look at the flashing. I'm looking for holes, missing pieces, damaged roofing shingles, I'm walking on the roof. I'm feeling the roof decking underneath my feet. I'm looking at weaving or the valley. I'm looking how that valley looks, how it's diverting water away into the gutter, looking at the downspouts, looking at all the roof surfaces, looking for anything that doesn't look right. That's a ridge vent. So I take a picture of the ridge vent. That's how I got up on the roof. It's my roof ladder. And as I come down from the roof, I'm looking at other components. Like there are many components here, siding, uh, soffit fascia eaves, gutter, downspout, windows, other roof surfaces. The intersection between the roof shingles and the siding, you need flashing. 
in this area here. This is a critical area. Now you can't see everything. This is a visual only inspection and it's limited and restricted. You, you're not expected to pull up every shingle tab and look at the step flashing or the counter flashing or the ceiling, sealant, if there is any. There's some sealant there. It's a gable vent, looks okay. Little white silicone, that's okay. This is sealed up well. Little detail there. And I look th th at every vent penetration, every pipe penetration, anything that penetrates through this shingle roof. Now the roofing material, it's not designed to be waterproof. It's designed to be weather resistant, water resistant. So anything that goes through the roofing material, roof covering material, I'm going to pay particular attention. And I'm going to think about how water travels. Everything should be diverted and flashed away. So this is running down, diverting and flashing away, flashed away. Down that way. And I'm going to take a look around there. There's another roof penetration. So I know I have um, some kind of combustion, a gas, probably natural gas at this house. This is probably from the heating system, maybe a combination of the hot water source and the heating system, HVAC system. And it's got a collar flashing around it. It looks really good. Nice and tight. It's painted up. Looks good. Another penetration is a vent, just like a ridge vent, or maybe it's a bathroom fan or, or something coming through the roof. And I took a look underneath and ah, there's lint on this vent and it's clogged. I should have took another picture. This is a blurry picture of a ton of lint in this vent. And we do not want lint clogging a dryer vent, especially on the roof, right? It's not really conspicuous. You can't really see smoke coming out of it, right? Not everybody looks up on the roof for fire. So this is a fire hazard. I'm not sure how another inspector who didn't get up on the roof would find this fire hazard. I'm not sure we can talk about that later, but sometimes there's an advantage of really getting close to systems and components. And when I walk up on the roof, that's one of the advantages that I have. Remember, I'm thinking about all the time, I'm thinking about how I can provide more value to my clients so that they really appreciate my services and they're willing to pay me. See, I, I don't charge based upon hour or time. I charge my inspection fee based upon the value that I provide. So I'm all about trying to provide overwhelming value to my clients. And right here, a big smile comes on my face because I found a fire hazard that probably no one else could find. I doubt anybody else could find us. And I can't wait to get down off the roof, off my ladder and tell my client, I found fire hazard and it's easy to fix. I'm not trying to kill a deal. I'm not jumping up and down and yelling about fire, fire. Actually, I'm always smiling because I know deep down inside, like I'm providing my client incredible value. Whenever I come across a major problem, right? I, I tend to smile because I have proven my worth. And that is the whole goal, to be successful in, I would say, any business. Whether you're in business for yourself or you're thinking about working for someone else, you have to be of value. And if you're perceived as someone who gives overwhelming value according to the cost, then man, you are going to be successful in anything you do. But we're talking about home inspections. I love shots like this. I love taking pictures of the gutter. I mean, that just goes to show that I was looking at just about, I'm trying to find everything, you know? But while I'm looking at these things and I'm, I'm taking pictures of pipes and roofing shingles and dryer vents and things like that, the big thing that a roof does is it protects the structure from water when it rains. And so I have this mental image in my head. 
while I'm performing an inspection of the exterior, the roof and the siding and the grating. I'm thinking about how rainwater drops from the sky onto the roof, whether it's sloped or low slope, steep slope. And then how is it diverted away from the building? We want this water to get away from the building. Even if you're in a semi-arid area, right? This, there could be a storm nowadays, you know, there's unexpected storms show up everywhere now. So how does water interact with the building materials? It's so fascinating. The whole building code is designed in some ways to divert water away because water is a great source of life, but man, water can destroy. Water destroys buildings. And so you have to build well to get water away. And so when water comes down, it has to be diverted away. It drops off the edge of the roof. Where? Maybe it gets caught in a gutter and that gutter collects that water and it drains it down a pipe. And then that pipe diverts it away from the house. Or maybe it just drops down and it hits the deck. You know, And there should be flashing where the railing meets the deck, right? Or if it hits a window, there should be flashing where the window, on the top of the window and the bottom of the window, always trying to kick out and divert away. And then when it hits the ground, what happens? You know, there should be flashing at the bottom, trying to kick it away. Or if it goes through the ground, it, there should be a pipe, some kind of drainage, gravel or pipes. And the ground and the grass and the grading should be sloped away. Everything should be kind of like sloped. Away. And so all of this is thought about while I'm taking a picture of that. I'm trying to think, water's going to jump jump off the edge here, drip right off and get it collected. And now I need to find the downspout and where's the end of the downspout and is it diverting water away? Here's the other side of the roof. Water's collecting, drips off. There's a little piece of flashing there. You learn about that, about the drip edges. And then downspouts, diverting water away. So much fun. Oh, when I'm, when I'm up here, I might as well take a, a little video. Can you hear the this? asphalt shingle roof appears to be in good shape. I don't see anything cracked or damaged. No missing shingles. This is a young roof, plenty of life left on it. The shingles are lying flat, the granular surface is good. There's a ridge vent providing ventilation for the attic space. There's flashing around the sewer vent. I mean, just I go on and on because my client is not with me, so I'm actually taking a lot of roof. pictures. Probably 400, 500 pictures on this uh, home inspection, maybe 50 to 60 of the roof, and then Including video. the garage and the front porch roof like, Whoa, are in the like, same good condition. You know? And so my client is going to get this really great experience and a lot of information. Next system in the standards of practice is exterior. But before we go there, John asks, would a drone inspection be better? I love drones now. Now they're really great. 15, 10 years ago, they weren't great. They were huge, very expensive, and the blurry pictures and you couldn't control. Now, uh, I got my drone somewhere. It's so small. Sometimes I forget where it is. So here's my drone. And I like D, J, I. D, J, I drones. This little fella, I don't leave home without. What is it? Less than a like 250 grams or something or less than a half a pound, you know, it's a little thing. And uh, 4K pictures and video. Now, John, good question. You can inspect the roof, any roof, without leaving the ground. That's, uh, that's really good. And they just changed FAA in the United States, FAA, um, Federal Aviation, administration um, that regulates flying drones in the skies for the United States. Um, if you're going to do it for fun, you have to take an exam. You have to take an exam, even if you want to do it for fun. So they changed the rule, but I don't think anybody knows about it. Grading, uh, hard surfaces, they need to be sloped away from the house, like a driveway, asphalt driveway. So I like to look here in these grooves and corners and, and like, all this flashing in the ceiling, like, you know, I'm looking for things of different materials 
interacting and intersecting with each other. Like you could see, see this flashing coming down here? Oh, sorry. See the siding coming down here? And this material, these two things, vinyl siding, masonry brick, they're different materials. There should be flashing in between, not sealant. It could be flashing. Look, there's flashing. So cool. This house is built well, I think. I'm like, hmm. And then I forget what's underneath. Was there a pothole underneath where I park? So I get on my knees, bam, shot of underneath my inspection vehicle. I inspect everything. And when I'm inspecting, I'm just snapping pictures like crazy. And the software that I use, you can throw pictures in real quick. Boom, 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 boom. Um, hard surfaces, walkways, um, looking for high steps here. This, this is a high step right here. Uh, it's this sidewalk settled a little bit. And so um, there's a little bit of a trip hazard right there. No big deal. And there's a little damage to the, the walk, the concrete spalled and cracked a little bit. And, oh, I did a little video. The front walk has some scaling of the concrete. That's pretty yeah. minor. Yeah, it's pretty minor. No big deal. There's the front door. It's, you have to you're required to inspect all of the exterior doors, all exterior doors and representative number of windows because you can't inspect all the windows on the exterior from the exterior or even in the interior. It's a representative number of windows. A house could have 40 windows. You can spend an entire hour just looking at every window. That's not a value, right? That's not a value unless you're doing a window only inspection. You're doing a home inspection according to the standards of practice. So you're required to inspect a representative number of windows, not all the windows. So I'm looking at the grading. Remember the downspout being diverted away? That's good. I'm trying to get underneath, making sure the, um, the ground is sloped away. We don't want water puddles up against the foundation close to the house. So I tend to look at a door the same way I look at a window from the exterior. Um, the corners, uh, top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left, kind of like a clockwise thing, or you can do counterclockwise, top right, top left, bottom left, bottom right, whatever, however you inspect it, just inspect it the same way over and over again. Because if you do that inspection process, and it's the same consistent process, then defects tend to just jump out at you. So I'm looking at the bottom corners of the garage door. And there's that flashing there. It's a little bent. And that's, you know, it's very minor. If this was a brand new home. I'd probably bring that up to the supervisor. Maybe we can bend that back down because that's, that would allow water driven rain to go underneath there. Um, I just grabbed a, a brick and it came out in my hand. I didn't break it. I didn't break the mortar joints. I didn't hit it hard in order to loosen up. It just was one of those things where you touch things and sometimes they break in your hand. I'm not going to repair this. This is a defect. It's not a major defect. Unfortunately, it was just aesthetically unpleasing too, right? Because look, like they couldn't measure this quite right. They didn't cut all the, of the bricks so that they would be uniform. They just cut this one. They didn't even cut it well. And the mortar was too thick here. And probably that's the whole problem, right? They just kind of squished that in there. But it's loose. And it's loose in my hand. Now, someone could try to accuse me of breaking the brick or something. And you have to come back with some mortar or something. I'm not responsible for damage that I do during an inspection like this. I, I essentially cracked or moved the brick, right? It's not supposed to move. It's not supposed to, the mortar isn't supposed to. So what happens when I do damage during the inspection? I take a picture and I put it in the report as a correction recommended. What if I, um, another example, what if I turn on the dishwasher? Remember 11 o'clock, I'll be in the kitchen. What if I turn on the dishwasher and the dishwasher does a short cycle, but leaks water all over the kitchen floor. Am I responsible for that? No. I try to wop, uh, mop up, wipe up the water off the floor. And then I take a picture of the leaking dishwasher and I put it in the report as a need of correction. Right? What if I trip a ground fault with my ground fault 
tester, right? Trip one of the receptacles downstream of a GFCI. I go back to the GFCI and I reset it and it won't reset. I damage that GFCI by testing it. I take a picture and I put it in the report as a need of correction. I don't buy a new dishwasher. I don't hire a mason. I don't hire an electrician to replace the GFCI. I'm there to find problems and document them. And if something breaks, like the smoke detector falls out of the ceiling when I test the test button, like I'm not fixing that. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to do damage during inspection. If I push the garage door opener and the garage door falls off the rail and I damage the garage door, I'm not paying for a new garage door or opener. I'm taking a picture because that's not supposed to happen. These things, we call them, according to the standards of practice, normal operating controls, right? You're, you should be able to touch a brick without it falling out of your, <laughs> into your hand. You should be able to turn on a dishwasher without it leaking on the floor. You should be able to test the DFCI tester without breaking the receptacle. You should be able to test your smoke detector without falling out. You should be able to open and close the garage door without it you know, falling on your car. So that's one of the benefits of reading the standards of practice. It tells you what to expect and what you're responsible for and what you're not responsible for. And when you get that through your head, like I'm not responsible for finding all the problems, right? There could be a major defect above my head and I'm performing an inspection of this room. There could be a major defect above my head. I'm not responsible for putting it in the report if I don't see it or I don't consider it a, a major problem. The report, you are required as a home inspector to put in the report, not every problem of the home, you can't find them all, but only those defects that you both observe and consider it to be major. What if you see a thing and you look at it and I don't, I don't consider it to be a, a major material defect. It won't be in the report. What if there's a major material defect above my head, but it wasn't observed? I can't see it. What if it's behind the wall or underneath the carpet? I don't observe it. It won't be in the report. What's in the report, what you're required to put in the report are all of the major material defects that you consider to be really big that you see. Inside the report should be written all of the defects that you both observe and consider to be major defects. You're not required to find every problem in a home. It'll take you forever. It's impossible. Most problems you don't even see. Most problems sellers don't even know about. Sellers are like, what? The dishwasher does what? I don't use the dishwasher. The dishwasher leaks all on the floor. What? So I think this wavy thing on the siding is either a grill that got too hot, too, too close, or... Um, there's a window maybe from the neighbor or something that when the sun comes, it hits right there and there's intense heat in this one area and it melts the siding. That happens. There was a, there was a study about um, sunlight reflecting off of someone's window and melting vinyl siding. I don't know what the problem is. I'm not here to... to Diagnose. We don't diagnose. Home inspectors do not diagnose problems. We just, if I both observe and deem it to be material, it's going to be in the report. So there's the components. There's a light fixture there. There's GFCI protected receptacles. All receptacles on the outside need to be GFCI protected. A little video about that. Uh, water faucets, hose bibs, um, the code calls them. Um, there's a, an exhaust pipe right there used as a hose uh, collector, not very good, crack off. But I think that's uh, 
high efficiency exhaust for mm, hot water tank, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'll just keep that to myself until I go inside the basement where those appliances are. The deck looks pretty good. The railing, the space between the spindles is small enough so no one falls through. Everything feels good. You can push on that railing, push outwards. The code used to be like you shake it back and forth, but it's really all about you know people leaning on it and falling outwards. It should hold your weight. And I can't really crawl around, but I'm going to do my best to look for joist hangers and fasteners and the ledger board and the flashing. And this all looks really good. This is really, really good. I'm having a lot of fun. I don't have a fireplace, like a wood burning fireplace. I have a factory built kind of like um, direct vent fireplace with this crazy orientation of metal that allows air from outside used for combustion, used for combustion in the fireplace and then exhausting the hot gases out. Um, so you should never see, this is very complicated. It's designed to be in this way. You should never see modifications. You shouldn't see anything covering it. You shouldn't see anything hanging on it. You shouldn't see any rust or damage or anything like that. Don't fill up the holes. Don't cover the, the screens or anything like that. There shouldn't be any bird's nest in there. So it's, it's supposed to look just like that, according to the manufacturer's recommendations on how to install it. And actually, you're not required to know that, but I'm looking for just any problems, any damage. Sometimes a, a baseball or a football will hit this thing and, and bend it. Next system is heating and cooling. I'm done with the roof. I'm done with the exterior. My client has probably not walked around very much with me, but the real estate agent may be. And I'm writing the report as I inspect. And I'm done with those two systems. Now I'm going to do the heavy lifting, remember? So around 8.15, I got there at 7.45, met my client, did the roof, met my client, exterior, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, that's no big deal. Now I'm going to do the heavy lifting at about 8.15. I'm going to wrap this up at about 10 o'clock. Where am I at 10 o'clock? We've gone over this. Where am I in about two hours from the starting point of my home inspection? If I'm doing a typical home, three three bedroom, two and a half bath home, 3,000 square feet, attached garage. About 10 o'clock, I should be in the attic. Why am, I, why, why am I thinking about this stuff? Because it's all about time management. There's a mathematical equation that I like. It's a fraction and the top part and the bottom part, right? This divided by this, right? So the top part, the numerator is divided by the denominator. The numerator, think of the numerator in business as money, gross revenue. You want to increase gross revenue. Divide it by what is the rule of thumb for success as a home inspector? Money divided by what? Time. Money divided by time. How much money you're going to make during this inspection and how much time do you have to spend to make it? If you can increase the numerator, if you can increase the gross revenue and decrease, be efficient with your time, now you're making profit. It's that easy mathematical fraction. Gross revenue divided by your time. If I'm making $500 in three hours, I'm happy with that. That's pretty good per hour fee. I'm pretty good with that. Come home with $500 in a few hours. Okay. Sounds like fun to be a home inspector. Yep. And if you're a home inspector already and you're not thinking like that, you, you should. You should, buy, you should, be, you should know the difference between profit, gross revenue, net profit and profitability, right? A lot of inspectors go, well, we grossed a hundred uh, $100,000 last year, or we grossed $1 million last year. I don't care about your gross revenue. You have to figure out, are you, were you profitable? How much profit did you make, right? Because somebody could do a home inspection. Uh, let's make it to the math easy, right? Somebody could do a $500 home inspection and take 10 hours, right? You don't want to do that. 
nobody wants to 10 hours of their life to do a home inspection. It should be about two or three hours, four hours, big houses, something like that. A few hundred dollars. But it's really based upon math, that math there. And also how much money do you want to make? I mean, calculating a profitable inspection fee is a mathematical equation. It's, it isn't about like your feelings or what your com competitors are doing necessarily. It's about math again. What desired annual salary do you do you have? Mm, you know, what other costs do you have running a business? And how much profit, minimum profit, do you want to make? Like 20% profit, like 50% profit or something? And you figure all that out and you can figure out how much you should be charging for performing an inspection that takes three or four hours. There's various ways to figure out how to be profitable as a home inspector. And we have a home inspection business course. We have a home inspection business and marketing course that allows you to figure that out. Um, let's see, before the next one, heating and cooling. Would a drone be better? Uh, uh, what software do you use that excerpts pictures that fast, that, that accepts pictures that fast? Uh, okay, so Paul and Josh ask about, um, you can email me, I have a, a few recommendations, but what's on my phone right now is Spectora, Spectora. Dot com. They're a great software company, spectora.com. Uh, does InterNACHI have a phase inspection classes or are they single system classes? Um, we do phase inspection videos. We have some training resources for you. Yep. Um, just email the education team, education at internachi.org, education at internachi.org. They're on the contact page as well. Is it okay to move systems that are in the way of your inspection? When's it not okay to do this? It's okay to move some systems some components, like a little bit of stuff, you know, just to see some things. Um, I may lift, you know, some shingle tabs to look for flashing, or I may um, move something in order to reach a, a light switch, but I'm not responsible for moving personal items, lifting carpeting, um, moving drop ceiling tiles, um, moving insulation. I'm not required to move anything. I'm actually. You can think of a home inspection like this. You get both hands, you put this hand behind your back, and then you get this hand behind your back. And you should be able to do a home inspection according to the standards of practice because it's visual only, right? Now, there's those normal operating controls that I mentioned, right? The thermostat, I'm going to turn on the thermostat right, right now in a little bit. So the, that's one of the exceptions to the rule. Heating, remember on the roof, there was that black pipe I knew I had some kind of fuel combustion appliance, maybe a heating system or hot water tank or both. Well, here's natural gas coming in um, from the street. So we have gas through a, a valve pressure regulator. Don't worry about the surface rust, the meter itself, and then the line goes into the house. And there's a shutoff valve there. I like to take a look at the system like this and then move closer and actually touch each component. And in my inspection report, you'll see that I describe the system and the pictures right there. And then I describe the components that are in sequence and that's in the inspection report. And that's a, um, a video, uh, manifold. So this house has a manifold. This is really nice. Uh, this is the line coming in drip, um, leg and regulator, another valve, and then it branches off. That's really cool. So I've got four lines, hmm. uh, furnace, hot water, stove, grill. I don't know. Should be labeled. I don't know why they don't just label them for me. Air conditioner unit, really good base. It's suspended off of the foundation itself. That's really cool. Off the floor. Um, so it's a good air conditioner unit. I'll turn that on for a moment and take a temperature or, or use my hand or to see if it's cooling off. There's an emergency shutoff switch for the unit so you can turn off this system. And then, you know, from this distance, you should be able to identify what kind of heating and cooling system you have. I have natural gas. There's that line again, right from the manifold, shutoff valve, drip leg, furnace, gas furnace, exhaust pipe. That goes through. We saw it on the roof. It's painted black. Air circulates, a forced air. Air circulates, comes down here. Through an air filter here, I see an, an extra one there. They change it just before I show up. And then they heat it up there and the air conditioning coil uh, is here and then it goes through. And then you've got a humidifier 
in this area when it is um, cold, is a cold climate. So when it's cold, it's um, you can humidify the air um, and it, the excess humidity uh, water from the filter here drains into a, a little pump. So does the air conditioner from the coil when it's running, condensate is produced and it drains into a sump pump. And then that sump pump has a discharge tube that goes out. And uh, that's, that's about it, you know? So you should be able to, you know, identify, there's more components, you know? Um, but if you get this, and you, you can explain how things work at this system. This is a gas-fired furnace, forced air with a central air conditioning system. And it's forced air, and there's ductwork, and there's an air filter. That's awesome. Yeah. So I get a little closer, look at components, system far away, and then I get up closer and look at components, and there's the, there's the gas supply coming in, union, pilot, um, igniter, burners, service switch, gas shutoff valve, draft inducer fan. They don't make natural low efficiency furnaces anymore, natural draft. There's always some kind of draft motor, inducer, blower. Uh, there's the ports. I like that shot. It's a close-up shot of the igniter right there. And then um, just looking for rust and corrosion. Exhaust pipe looks good. Sometimes exhaust pipes have condensate problems. And that's a, it's like when you see dripping or something like that or rust, you don't want to see that. And that's the blower fan. Sometimes there's some codes you can see. And if you know the manufacturer's label, you can look at the codes, but there's no problems here. And I'm just looking for problems, like a bunch of loose wires, melted wires, that would be a problem. Uh, rust, animals, animal droppings, um, that would be another problem. Here's the air filter, airflow. I didn't think it would be here, but it actually is here. So they have this nice little um, opening here. Uh, humidifier, April air. Uh, this needs to be replaced every year. When it gets funky, there's a damper, there's a water valve coming in and it taps from usually where the hot water source is, the hot water tank, and that's the pin valve. Um, and there's the air conditioner coil in here. I really can't see a whole lot other than the line that I saw on the outside near the compressor. There's the liquid line and the suction line and the suction line is cold and it's wrapped. And sometimes air comes out through here and and you know some condensate uh, drips and drains and no big deal. I just don't want to see major rust and corrosion. And then condensate pump, we saw that wired up, plugged in, and it discharges outside through a tube, and it's plugged in there. So really, I, I inspected the system, and then I inspected every component of the system, and that's how I inspect. That's how the standards of practice is set up so that you inspect a system and then it describes every component of that system that you need to inspect. So that was a quick, I would say five, 10 minutes at the furnace heat, you know, do a little heating cycle, a little cooling cycle and educate my client about the heating and cooling system. And that's about it for that system. Water heating equipment, mm, water heating equipment or water heater, that's anything, any appliance, they call them appliances. I think of kitchen appliances, any appliance or, you know, machine that heats potable water and then distributes it or supplies it, that potable drinkable water um, through the water distribution system of the, of the home. And we get these terms like water heating equipment or water heater or hot water source from code, the International Residential Code is what InterNACHI prefers. And the training that you get at InterNACHI school, the home inspector college at internachi.edu is all based upon code. So a lot of home inspectors say we're not code inspectors and we don't have nothing to do with code, but actually they've been trained on code. So all of our courses are based upon the building code. And building code within the building code, for example, um, there are systems and components that you have to know about, right? You have to learn the components of the, of the system and how they should be uh, functioning well so that they're safe and sound and performing efficiently. And code, knowing code, well, basically, one of the things that code does is um, it protects people from getting harmed. 
So for example, smoke detectors weren't actually that important a few decades ago. When I was inspecting, you had a, a smoke detector in the house, at least one. Then it went to every level, every floor had a smoke. And then it went to every bedroom. And then it went to every bedroom, every hallway outside the bedroom, on every floor, right? And then carbon monoxide detectors, right? Same thing with AFCIs and GFCIs. You can inspect old historic homes that have no, they weren't built with, built with GFCIs, but now they're required. Same thing with AFCIs. You may be inspecting homes that were built back then to code, but now AFCIs would be a great idea, just like GFCIs. So if you're inspecting a home and it was built to code back then and GFCIs on every kitchen counter receptacle, GFCI protection wasn't required at every kitchen counter receptacle. It was only required within six feet of the kitchen sink. Well, that's a defect based upon standards, modern standards, because people get hurt. People got hurt because not all of the kitchen counter receptacles were protected by GFCI. It was only those next to the kitchen sink, but turns out you need protection everywhere there's a kitchen counter. Even if it's far away from the kitchen sink, if it's a kitchen counter, it has to have GFCI protection for the receptacles. That's a new code that now helps protect people from getting shocked, electrocution. So if you're inspecting a home and you see something like that, like, hmm, there's, there are no smoke detectors in the bedrooms. Someone may say, like a real estate agent may say, well, that's how it was built. Well, you know, modern building standards require something else. They require smoke detectors in every bedroom. They require GFCI protection in every bathroom. You, know, you can't, can't have an outdoor receptacle without GFCI protection. And it doesn't matter when the home was built. That's now expected, these safety items. So when you think about going to a, a training school, I've, I've found that unaccredited training schools don't care about these things. And they, they don't really keep up on the building code. InterNACHI does. InterNACHI's training courses are always updated live continuously based upon the latest building standards and code. Okay? So let's go to the water heating equipment. Let's check it out. It's wrapped in, in a blanket. I can't see a thing. That's an inspection restriction. Uh, they uh, really don't need to wrap uh, hot water tanks anymore. Um, I mean, you can, but it's, it's, there are other ways to um, be uh, save energy that are more uh, easier and efficient. So there's the gas water, a gas shutoff valve, um, expansion tank, and there's the vent connector to the chimney that we saw earlier. Really can't see anything else. Um, TPR valve is somewhere wrapped in there. That's, that's the TPR valve. You know, there are 14 requirements for the TPR valve. I code, there are 14 requirements for that TPR discharge pipe, just for the discharge pipe, not for the valve, just for the discharge pipe. That's pretty cool. How would I know that if I'm inspecting the hot water tank? Well, I carry with me my checklist my software, which is essentially um, a checklist that allows me to do the inspection and re helps me reduce mistakes because it reminds me of what those 14 things are with the TPR discharge pipe, according to code. So a little tip there. It's one of the reasons why every home inspector should use mobile inspection software. Uh, let's see. Paul says, does that profitability still apply when you're brand spanking new? Heck yeah. Yeah, you have to calculate. You have to make sure you're making enough money, especially when you're new. Do not, do not go into the red 
into debt, do not just guess on what to charge, especially in the beginning. In the beginning, you have to be calculating a profitable inspection fee. So just go, because we want you to last. I mean, a veteran inspector, if they kind of mess up on estimating the price of a big commercial building, they, they can, you know, absorb that mistake. You know, they can recover. But when you're new, a mistake, like not charging enough, you know, for an entire week, that could really hurt. So what you want to do is go to a chapter 11 of the Home Inspection Business and Marketing course at Internachi. Let me take you there. Should, I, should we go there? Let me just open this link. Let's go to natchi.org and you go to getting started. So natchi.org, N-A-C-H-I.org. You go to our training and education page and go search for business. And you get to the course, Home Inspection Business and Marketing Course. And you log on and you go to chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we go through two home inspectors, Inspector John and Inspector Mary, and they're trying to figure out what to charge. How much money should they make as a salary or as a business or per hour? What do they use in order to calculate a profitable home inspection fee? And what is the difference between profit, profitability, and profit margin? This is a free online accredited home inspection business and marketing course provided by the only home inspector college, Internachi School at internachi.edu. When's the last time you took a business course for your home inspection business? This is it. If you're gonna, if you're gonna attend any event about business and marketing, if you're going to take any class, live class about business and marketing, if you're going to take any course, if you're gonna spend any money about learning about home inspection, business and marketing, stop and take InterNACHI's free online home inspection, business and marketing course first. It's the best thing that you can do, whether you're new or a veteran inspector. Because experienced inspectors, they're doing the same thing as you, new inspectors. We're all marketing, trying to get that phone to ring and trying to get that website to schedule the next inspection. And we're trying to be profitable and valuable. And this is probably one of the best things about running your own business. You get to think about all this stuff at the same time while you're inspecting the hot water tank <laughs> or this, this crazy thing. What is this? Holy cow. I knew they liked the manifold with the gas, but they liked the manifold system for the water too. So this is a manifold system. Um, so let's see. Cold water comes in and is distributed throughout the house. Each fixture has a, a cold water and hot water. So this cold water here goes to the hot water tank, the water heating equipment, water heating appliance, and comes back hot and is distributed through here. And it also can cycle through. There's a few things that you should know. There should be a shutoff key. There's a, there should be a main shutoff valve and the key is right there, I can see. And every line coming out of here, should have a support within, I think it's four to six inches. And this one doesn't, there are no supports for any of these lines. They need a support, a little strap, a secure clamp, something. And every line coming out needs to be straight out of this valve. It can't be kinked. It can't be coming out at an angle like these lines. These are pretty good, pretty good, but these starting to curve, curve. This one's curving. Mm, they really need to be coming out straight. And that's why you get a clamp there because when you're a plumber, you just measure this and put the clamp there and the line is gonna be curving after the clamp. Cause you don't wanna kink here, it slowly drips. Each one is 
specifically identified. And yeah, so there's a couple of things that could be done. Oh, any unused ports should be capped off with a cap, okay? Oh, think of a PAX manifold. That's what this is, polyethylene crosslink. As the plumbing equivalent of a main electrical panel. And this was described in Fine Home Building, issue 261. So the PEX manifold is just like a main electrical panel. It's the central distribution hub for all the water running to your household fixtures. And the concept is that each fixture or group of fixtures in the house has its own water supply line stemming from a central point a configuration known as a home run setup. And every, there's the valve there. Every run is specific to the fixture. That's really cool. I really like this. So what if you wanted to learn more about inspecting systems like this, modern, modern kind of system? Well, you go to education page again, and you type in plumbing. And there's a residential plumbing for inspectors. You open up the free online plumbing course. You go to section 6.6, .6, water di distribution pipe, and there's the manifold, the pe PEX manifold, right? And we talk about how to inspect a complex system like this. So I don't care what you come across during a home inspection. InterNACHI has the training course for you. It could be about business. It could be about marketing. It could be about a particular system. And we have that for you. And it's free and online for all internet team members. So there's the manifold, really cool system. I like it. Water coming in, these should be capped and they're not. There's the key, shutoff valve. They're coming out, out at an angle, that's no good. Coming out at an angle and they're not even supported or strapped and they're missing supports here. So a couple of recommendations at that complicated system. Not really complicated, it just looks really complicated. Uh, drain waste vent, looking for things that slope away. Um, you know, it should be going downhill, as they say, all things like that goes downhill and then it goes through the foundation wall there. That's all good. And water coming in, public water through a main shutoff valve, uh, water meter that has that meter outside, the reader. And the check valve, that's why there's an expansion tank at the water heating equipment. There's another shutoff valve and there's a jumper cable. And so those two go together. When you have a check valve at the water meter and water shutoff valve coming into the house, a check valve, that means water doesn't go backwards. So what happens when your hot water tank heats up water? Well, it increases pressure in the line. It can. How do you release that pressure? You have an expansion tank. What if you didn't have an expansion tank and you had a check valve and a closed system, you have a closed water system and a hot water source on that system that's heating up water? You know what water does when it heats up? It expands and it increases pressure. If you don't have an expansion tank, take a look at the TPR valve. If the TPR valve is dripping, you may just have a pressure problem little tip there. Okay, basement foundation crawl space structure is next on the on the standards of practice, which is essentially um, a bullet point list of things to go inspect. And here's the basement. Talk about moving personal items. I am not moving all this stuff. No way. No way. I am not moving this. I'm not required to. It's not a decision. I'm just not required to. Thank goodness. It's a visual only inspection. Now, what if, right? What if, I know what you're thinking, Ben. What if there's a, a crack in the foundation right there and there's water coming in right there, right? Right behind this box. Well, remember, the inspection report has in it, I'm required to write in the inspection report. Defects, all the defects that I both see and consider to be material or major defects. I have to see the defect in order for it to appear in the report. 
what if my client moves in? I know what you're thinking, but what if my client moves in and all these things are gone because the seller moved out and took all their stuff, right? That's up against the foundation wall. Now this is all exposed, all cleaned up. And there's a big hole there with water coming in. Oh, my client's going to go, well, wait a minute. I'm going to call my home inspector. See why he or she didn't see this. It's not in a report, is it? No. You know why it's not in a report? Because I didn't see it. Can't see it. It has to be both observed and deemed to be, considered to be a major problem. That's why I love reminding my clients and scheduling my clients walkthrough inspections. A walkthrough inspection is one of the best things that you can do. It allows you to make more money and it also helps your client with that last visual check. You're looking for problems that you couldn't see the first inspection. So you do a walkthrough, very quick walkthrough, literally just keep on walking. Like you walk through the house very quickly, like half hour for the whole home, half hour walkthrough before they sign on the line at the bank that I am going to now buy this home. Before that, an hour before that, you do a walkthrough inspection for your client. When the house is completely empty because the seller has moved and you can see more stuff. So when you are, when you hire inspector website builder, inspector website builder.com to build your website, right? It will convert that design. It's a fantastic service of incredible value. Inspector website builder designs websites that convert visitors into clients. And when you convert a visitor into a client and a scheduled client, and they're scheduling a home inspection with you, you should also be scheduling a walkthrough inspection. Now you're scheduling two inspections for every potential client. You're going to remind them of the incredible, critical, important moment before they sign on the line that we have to walk through the home, walk through the house one more time. Okay. So now you're scheduling two inspections instead of just one inspection. Scheduling the home inspection and the walkthrough inspection before closing so that you can see things that you couldn't see at the time of the first inspection because of these inspection restrictions. It's so important to do that. Now you're scheduling two inspections. You want to you learn how to schedule three inspections at the same time? <laughs> right? You're not just scheduling one inspection or two inspections. It's going to be three. Okay. Schedule a home inspection. InspectorWebsiteBuilder.com designs a website. Visitors, schedule clients, and they schedule a home inspection. You schedule a walkthrough inspection, and then you schedule the annual maintenance inspection so that... <clears throat> You are helping your clients maintain the home a year after your first inspection. And you'll do another walkthrough just to make sure everything's okay. Three inspections. Veteran inspectors don't do this. You're now learning how to schedule three inspections. I've met, I don't know how many thousands of home inspectors out there. And they say, we're really successful. We grossed a million dollars. Who cares about the grossing, right? You need profit. You need to be scheduling three inspections with every client. That's one of the, I think there's seven. There's only seven ways you can make more money in this home inspection business. And one of them is you schedule more inspections per client. That's one of them. That's the that's one of the one of the seven ways you make more money in this business. I can tell you the other six, but this is one of them. And most of the inspectors don't. Got to schedule a home inspection, walk through before closing, annual maintenance inspection. There are other inspections you can you can schedule too. We can do that in some other class. It just keeps going on and on. That's how incredibly value home inspectors are. Every home should be inspected. Every home should be inspected. And every home should be inspected every year. 
This is the basement sump pump, which is essentially a bucket with a hole in the bottom that allows groundwater to find that relief, that bucket, and pumps it out, discharges it out. I couldn't get this thing to work. I could not get this thing to work. There's some kind of clog or something. And so I grabbed the pipe and I'm like, I'm not trying to break it, but like I grabbed the pipe and I, I want to give it a little wiggle. And the discharge pipe comes loose at the same time, the pump kicks on <laughs> and, it, and it just discharges all over the place, right? So I pull out the plug real quick, okay? And I got my shoes wet and all that stuff. No big deal, no big deal. But something apparently is wrong with the pump float because there's so much crap in the, look, that's just all sludge. I don't know what is going on. And the check valve wasn't allowing the water to discharge. So a lot of things all happen all at once. And um, because it's installed, there, there, aren't, there isn't any sign of water penetration. There's, this is a dry basement, but there's a sump pump and it should be working properly just in case, right? It should be discharging outside. And that's that discharge that I see outside. Remember that? And they put the, they put the garden hose on top of it. Yeah, that's the discharge kind of strange it would be so high and there it is there's the garden hose right there right okay so um that sump pump needs to be fixed there's insulation above the concrete poured foundation where the uh like where the deck is attached to the house remember that deck and this tool to move insulation you know, i'm not required to move insulation but i do anyways and I use a gardening tool and I have one right here in my tool bag. And it's a, it's a three, three tine hoe. And one tine, I, I just flattened it a little bit, straightened it out a little bit. And these tines I leave curved so that I can grab insulation. I can also poke stuff too, you know, and um, it's extendable. So I open it up and, you know, and I poke insulation with it, right? And I put it right back. And I, it's a really cool tool. The cool tool I like is this um, meter here. It's a moisture meter. It's a probe. It has two probes here. It's also extendable. So extends, right? And the probes here. So it gives me a visual indicator and also an audible indicator if it senses moisture, right? And I use this for ceilings, for places like that, that deck there, and also through the carpeting, goes through the padding, and I can see if anything underneath it is wet. I'm not measuring moisture content. I don't care about measuring things. I approximate. I don't quantify. It's a, it's um, it's not a quantification. There's no, there's no. It's like it's qualification. It's not quantifying things. It's not measuring things. Home inspectors do not measure things. We kind of estimate. We look for anomalies, things that doesn't, things that don't look very good, and so that kind of moisture meter helps me do that. Uh, let's see, insulation, I'm looking for, you know, defects, things that are loose, leaking, water, anything like that, structural problems, there are inspection restrictions, yep, but just taking a look around at anything that I can see visually, and a smoke detector. Next, electrical, I'm still in the basement, remember, eight o'clock. I'm done with the roof. I do the exterior at 8.15. Now I'm doing these heavy systems. 10 o'clock, I want to be in the attic. So I got to go through the electrical. On the outside, there's an electrical meter. There's a conduit from the underground conduit going into the meter. And then the service entrance cable going into the electrical panel. There's the meter itself. Grounding rod. Grounding conductor. Um, so the grounding electrode. There's, the, there's uh, 
graphics. There are graphics from InterNACHI's gallery of illustrations and graphics and pictures that help me describe to my client what I'm inspecting and why this is good. And so, um, or why this is bad. And so this is the electrical panel, this is the bus bar, grounding electroconductor, and there's the grounding rod, right? And that's what I'm inspecting here. So just, you know, these pictures are free from our gallery and they help boost my inspection report. They make it look better. These illustrations make my inspection report look better. They help, my inspection report is easy to read and it's clear to understand with the help of InterNACHI's illustrations from our gallery. There's another illustration I like too. It kind of puts everything all in one thing. There's the electrical meter, right? If it's overhead conductors, I've got that, or underground conductors. And there's the, the grounding rod. And there's the member of the water lines, or the valve and the, the water meter and the jump. And there's electrical service panel where we're coming to. So these illustration, illustrations help my inspection report and my clients. There's the main electrical panel, main shutoff, disconnect. Two fingers means 200 amps. There's room for expansion. There's some AFCIs and GFCIs. Each breaker is labeled, inspection sticker. And when it, before we take a look at this, I wanna ask you a question. And here's a, another question for folks who are attending our live. So you should be able to see a poll for you attending our live class. And the question is, are you required to remove the dead front cover from the electrical panel according to the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice? Yes, no, I'm not sure. So a lot of people are participating and answering the question. Are you required to remove the dead front cover from the electrical panel during a home inspection according to the standards of practice? A lot of you, the internet standards of practice, I don't know of any other standards of practice. A lot of you are answering five seconds, four seconds, three, two, one, end the poll, share results. Y'all got it pretty good. Yep, most of you answered correctly. Are you required to remove the dead front cover from the electrical panel? No. Nope, 88% of you said no, that's good. Some of you said yes, and maybe you're thinking of something else, but according to the InterNACHI standards of practice for performing a home inspection, you are not required to remove the dead front cover. So you're not required to do this. But when I do that, sometimes I see things that I wouldn't normally see, but you're not required to do it and it's hazardous. I mean, this isn't high voltage, but you gotta be very safe. So I it is not recommended that you do it. Okay, it's, you can get a lot of trouble removing the dead front cover, not just your personal safety, but man, some things can spark. And I've been there, so I don't recommend it. But I want to show you the things that you can see if you do. So I don't see what I'm looking for when I remove the dead front is a common defect that would be major that I would see would be a, a big breaker on a thin gauge wire, fat breaker, size big on a very thin, small gauge wire, like a 20 amp breaker on a 14 gauge wire, right? It's not the right ampacity. So no problems there. It must be 10 o'clock because I'm in the attic, right? Two hours or so have passed and I'm in the attic and I'm doing the attic inspection the access panel to the attic is in the ceiling of the hallway and it's not a uh, ceiling of the closet and it's not insulated and it's not sealed. So it's essentially a hole in the ceiling and there's, there's just a lot of energy being lost there. There is a winter uh, cold climate. There's a cold climate and in the winter, they're conditioning, they're warming the rooms inside the house and it's essentially blowing right through um, this hole that's not insulated and not air sealed. There's no flooring in the attic. So I can't walk safely. 
throughout the attic. This is insulated ductwork. Want to make sure it's insulated and in good pieces. No, no open seams, no breaks, no tears. There's a lot of cellulose insulation, blown in cellulose insulation. Looks to be in professional condition, good, good insulation. The structure, the truss built roof seems to be in good shape. I don't, I'm looking for cut trusses, modified trusses. If a, if a truss, engineer truss is modified in the field, that's a structural defect. And then approximate depth of the insulation. Any penetration going through the ceiling, uh, through the roof deck, looking at that. There's that dryer vent. Remember the dryer vent? They wrapped it because it needs to be wrapped, insulated, because there's a lot of moisture and the heat and con uh, condensation can develop, especially in the wintertime in this area. And it's, you know, it's filled with lint, fire hazard. Other than that, I don't see any problems. There's the attic hatch and the uninsulated hatch. So it looks pretty good. I don't see any roof leaks or anything. It's insulated well. Next one is bathrooms. Um, let's see. Do you need to write a report for the walkthrough? It's up to your service and, and, and clients. Um, a lot of home inspectors don't, and I, that's why I prefer as well. It's just an easier way to provide that service. It's a faster, more efficient way to provide that service. If there is a defect observed during the walkthrough, then it can be documented. Just that, just put in a Word doc, slide a picture in, in a short paragraph on your letterhead. What would you typically charge for a walkthrough inspection? Um, we did them for free and anywhere up to a hundred bucks, especially if there was repair, like we could verify a repair before closing. Like we had a home inspection, found defects. They said that they were going to fix it. We come back through a walkthrough and we did a ver uh, repair verification inspection. Um, uh, annual walkthrough inspection, annual inspections, really it's, Again, you could do them for free and there's incredible value in them. You can do your walkthrough inspection. You can do your annual inspection because you keep in contact with your clients. And if they're in, if those relationships are good, then you're, you're working on word of mouth marketing and it's up to you to invest that time or money in creating that word of mouth marketing. If I keep all of my clients thinking of me and talking well of me, that's um, an investment I'm willing to take for my company. How much do you charge for uh, another question? Do you have any, do you have anything to stick in the hole to get the float to cut on instead of your hand on some? Yeah. So when you reach in a sump pump and it's wet, and there's a motor with electric supply, right? <laughs> it's really dumb. <laughs> I've just done it so many times. Really dumb idea to put your hand inside a bucket filled with water and electrical supply, right? Water and electricity should not be mixing and you should not be in the middle of that current. So again, we have um, this. You can pull it with this, right? And uh, there's a rubber um, at the end of it or uh, we have a stick, a little hook. Boop. Usually I don't do any of that. I grab the plastic discharge pipe. This is always plastic, non-conductive, and I try to wiggle it. If you can't get the float, I don't, I don't do it. There's only, there's only so much I'm going to do. Um, some of those, uh, you know, the, there's, um, there's that little hose on the, do you know about the little hose? I'll talk to you later. You know, where you plug in the plug, there's a little pressure. Um, you can make that turn on by sucking on the little hose and making a closed circuit. So careful when you stick your hand into things. You're absolutely right, Thomas. Uh, do you have a link to your gallery? Yep. So let's go to the gallery, which is nachi.org slash gallery. Nachi.org slash gallery is where the gallery is. And what do you want to look up? Oh, roof. So there's things about roof, like roof drainage, right? 
We want to drain that water away from the house foundation. Um, John says, are you able to insert these into your software? For sure. Yep. Uh, and Stephen uh, follows up with that. Thanks, Stephen. Do you still do home inspections? I do, but I don't have clients. I have cameras following me. So whenever I do a home inspection, um, it's usually in front of a camera. So I'm, uh, for example, I'm set up for about a dozen home inspections in the next two months, but no clients, just um, producing training inspection videos. Um, my clients are you, actually. So I work for InterNACHI members. So when I perform a home inspection, it's really for training purposes, just like this class, it's this InterNACHI webinar. We did the attic, 10 o'clock, I'm out of the attic, I'm doing the interior, which is bathrooms, representative number of windows, doors, uh, receptacles, lights, switches, floors, ceilings, walls, and I'm heading to the kitchen. There might be a garage in between, right? So this is the bathroom. I pound on the walls of the shower. I stand in the shower. I take a shower. No, I turn on the shower head to make sure there's plenty of adequate flow coming out of the shower head. I test the receptacles in the bathroom to make sure that they're GFCI protected and they are. I'll take a look at the drain waste vent pipes for the sink, the bathroom sinks, and the ventilation is a window. And I fill up the master bathroom tub and I turn on the Whirlpool tub. And I also find the access panel to the motor itself to make sure everything's okay in there. Sometimes there's a leak. There's often a leak some there. And, you know, the seller just doesn't, is unaware of a water leak often. So, and then I turn on the, the jets and make bubbly water at the jacuzzi that no one ever uses. And then you drain it and you wait for a leak because I don't know why they install so many jacuzzis in the United States that are not used. We just don't use them very often. And some of them are, have never been used or even tested often in new homes, homes that are new or one or two years old, you fill up the jacuzzi for the first time, you make bubbles, looks great, you drain it. And then no one has ever done this before, except you, the home inspector, you're the first person to make this tub with 50 gallons of water leak. So be careful. Um, flushing toilets that people have already used, it's probably not gonna leak, it'd be very surprising, but a fixture like this that no one has used before, and then it leaks, that's expected. I flush all the toilets, run all the sinks, look for all the GFCI protection that I can, look at the floors and the ceilings and the tiles, and I pound on the tiles. If my hand goes through the tile in that bathroom tub shower, that's a defect that I both observe and deem to be major. I do not repair the tile. That's not my job to repair problems that I find during a home inspection. So if my hand goes through that tile, it's not supposed to under normal conditions. Abnormal conditions would be that the backing board, the support board wall material behind the tile has been damaged by water from a leak. And now the tile is loose and cannot support a bump what if there was a, um, a handrail, a grip there for someone to get in for access and someone relied on that hand support that's attached to the tile that has rotten backing board, damaged backing board, right? So it's important to push on the tiles. You can pound on them, you can push on them, and it's okay. If your hand goes through, take a picture of it and put it in the report. Has it a defect that you observed during your inspection of the bathroom? There was a chip in the handle uh, fixture there, no big deal. Functional flow coming out of the showers, toilet flushed a couple times, GFCI protection, all in good shape. Interior, receptacles, windows, fixtures, handrails at the stairs, 
you know, taking pictures of just about everything and anything, you know, representative number of windows. I open and close a lot of the windows, you know, and doors, you know, if, if I can find a problem with the door, that's great. You know, a sticky door or something like that. It's pretty minor. I'm not really looking for any cosmetic issues like a stain or a scratch in the drywall. I'm not, I really don't care about that stuff. I'm looking for the big major things. That's, that's the value I provide. Let's see if we can find the big major things. Fireplace. Remember the fireplace on the outside? It was that direct vent with a special vent where air comes in and out. So this is the interior part. And it's on the switch. This is the kind of fire I like. Turn the switch on. Fire turns on. You can see the flames glowing. There's a shutoff valve and the components there. Igniter. No rust. Looks good. Turned it back off. Garage. I've got the garage. Now the kitchen. I'm going to end it in the kitchen. We're almost there. So two-car garage, garage door opener. Looks good. I've got the photoelectric eyes. They're functioning. When I put my foot in front of them, the door bounces back. That's great. It's got the spring and the safety coil and the wire, and it all looks good. The support, everything is looking good. The drywall looks good. The stairs are in good shape. No trip hazard. I can't see everything, but I'm looking. I'm looking around here. There could be something there, but I can't see it. Can't really comment. I have got my flashlight. I'm looking for anything that eats wood or damages wood. You know, it could be a termite or or something. Uh, GFCI protection at all receptacles in the garage. Laundry. That was just before the kitchen. They keep throwing rooms at us, right? Here's the laundry room. We're trying to get to the kitchen. Run hot and cold water. No leaks. Dryer, it's squished. So this is the dryer vent, right? Crazy. Crazy is a dryer vent. Wait a minute, dryer vent. The dryer vent terminates on the roof instead of just through the wall. Why don't they just go through the wall? This goes up from this dryer vent on the first floor, up the first floor wall, up through the second floor wall, up through the attic and gets clogged on the roof. Insane. So I don't know. Uh, I was a builder. So I would say this is a dumb idea. I would say that if I was right next to the builder, I'd be, you know, this, this, this idea is just dumb. It's not going to work. And I have proof. The vent is clogged because by the time it gets all the way up there, you've lost all of that airflow. And it's just like, it's probably just filled all the way through. Just go right off through. Somehow find an exterior wall when you're designing a home for a laundry. When you have vent terminations, we have mechanical vent terminations, that thing that's venting should be as close to the exterior wall as possible so that it can vent, that it has to terminate outside. So all mechanical vents, bathroom vents, dryer vents, kitchen vents, they all have to terminate outside. Uh, so you got the hoses, that's good. You need GFCI protection in the laundry and there's a water catch pan underneath the clothes washer, that's great. I'm in the kitchen, I got a big smile on my face because I'm about to get paid and I run hot and cold water. I mean, that's not why I'm here. Oh yeah, it is. Well, why am I in business? To make a great living, to make a ton of cash. You got to make a ton of cash when you're in business for yourself. That's why I'm excited to be in the kitchen because I'm going to make about 500 bucks right now in the kitchen and with a happy neighbor, with a happy client who's going to be my next door neighbor, essentially, right? And real estate agents looking on, thinking he's a big Ben's going to be my inspector from now on. I really care about my clients, but if I didn't make any money, all those feelings mean nothing. You have to make a lot of cash, a lot of profit when you're in business for yourself. That's what's so fun about being in business. So you can make a great living. And then you can do great things. You can give uh, to, you know, donate your money and, you know, support your local and, and, you know, go on vacation and pay your bills and all that good stuff. But you got to make money. You got to make money. And InterNACHI is really great at providing all the resources 
for you to make a great living being a home inspector. So I'm in the kitchen, got a big smile on my face, hot and cold water at the sink. I'm looking for problems. There's a garbage disposal switch inside the sink cabinet. Can't stand that. It's just difficult. Um, they should have a little push button at the top. Uh, there's the drain, both drains, GFCI protection at the kitchen counter receptacles, all of them, even the island has to be GFCI protected. I don't care when the house is built, we need GFCI protection. Dishwasher, it might leak, might not. Turn it on, short wash. And then the counter, I always try to move the kitchen counter, The sorry, the island um, sometimes is loose on the floor. Uh, one time it just fell over, a little kid got hurt, so um, I fatally hurt. So ever since then, that story has forced me to grab that counter and try to move it. If I can move it, that's a defect. And I'm looking for support underneath that um, overhang. It seems like a lot, right? Ideally, I would see like a metal overhang. Seems okay, so I'm gonna let it go. Gas stove needs an anti-tip for every stove, electric or gas, and all the burners turned on, the oven turned on, and the microwave. I got my microwave leak detector. There's the internet cheese microwave leak detector. You throw that in there, it's the shock and awe of running the microwave. Make sure this turns on when everyone's looking. You look like uh, you're doing something really important. Okay, um, here's the summary report, right? And, uh, you know, we've got, you probably remember them, at the mana block system, the PEX uh, manifold, unused ports, missing caps, water lines are coming out at slight angles. There are no su supports within the first six inches. And then the structure, uh, yeah, the sump pump, remember that, discharged water all over the place or some kind of clog. And uh, the dryer vent is a problem. So that's the summary of the report. And the summary, like I, I want to give this out to the, my real estate agent because they'll just use it as a checklist of things to go negotiate about, right? And I've got all of this, these four paragraphs that I've written and in, include that help protect me about this summary. A lot of inspectors hesitate in giving a summary because they want to just give the inspection report. Well, you have to figure out, my clients wanted a summary immediately. And so that's what I gave them. Like I asked my real estate agents, what do you want right after the inspection? They want a summary. Okay, that's what I provide. I don't, I don't, have, I don't care. So you know, if my services aren't meeting up with my client's needs, there's a disconnect. So what I do in business is what you have to think about in business is like whatever your whatever services you're providing, they have to meet the needs of your clients. And sometimes your clients don't even know what they need. So you offer them services like mold inspections. And they'll be like, oh yeah, we should get a mold inspection, right? So sometimes your clients don't know what they need, to need right? Well, there's a famous quote. What is it? Your clients don't know. It's your job to tell your clients what they need. Okay, so I provide a summary, but also give them a warning. Like, you know, if you're gonna negotiate over defects that were discovered during the inspection, ready? Don't rely on this summary. <laughs> there may be items in the full report that are not listed in the summary. Heck yeah. You know, we recommend that if any evaluations or corrections to the property are needed, then a professional should inspect the property even further than I did prior to closing in order to discover and repair related problems that were not identified in the report. Speaking of the report, here's the report itself and some information and what really matters. I put that and then a little, little scope and some disclaimers, like we're not roofing professionals, you know, feel free to hire one before closing. Um, where, where's the one? Uh, we're not gonna, you know, Let's see, where is that? I have one, it's, it's written somewhere that roofs leak. I basically just tell my clients that, you know, I'm not guaranteeing the roof won't leak. You know why? Because roofs leak, all roofs leak, right? 
in one way or another, eventually, if you let them go. Also, the home maintenance book. You got to give your clients the home maintenance book because you can tell the judge, if it ever gets to small claims, that you provided a home maintenance book and that in the agreement that they sign, right? They sign the agreement that they will read the um, home maintenance book just like they will read their inspection report, right? So they, they have read and understood the inspection report and they've read and understood the home maintenance book. You can have that agreement between you and your client that they will thoroughly read the entire inspection report, not the summary, the entire inspection report and ask you questions for anything that they don't understand. And you can also agree that they will read the home inspection book, uh, sorry, home maintenance book. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, here's uh, pictures that I threw in. I try to do, I think of three across. Um, it seems to fit really well on the page. And these are all the things that we, you and I have already seen. Remember the, the gutters and the downspouts? Yep. And there's the fireplace and it turned on. Remember the switch? And there's the chimney vent pipe. And here's the exterior, like systems of the exterior were, well, surface water management is really good at this house. Everything's diverting the, that water away and the wall covering materials. There's only one problem with that little, well, the little I think it was a grill, I'm not sure. And that one loose brick, remember that brick that came out? So these are good pictures, but sometimes I'll throw in a picture that helps me describe what is what is wrong, right? That brick is wrong. And this is, uh, it's cosmetic. It doesn't even show up in the summary, but it'll show up in the full report. Just like all these good pictures of the deck. All these good pictures of the meter. Heating system. So here's the system, right? The system. And then um, as I move in, I inspect components. And the way I inspected is the way the report is written. The way I inspect is how my software is structured sequentially. How my software is structured sequentially is based upon the standards of practice. So it's Standards of practice is the foundation on which your process, inspection process takes place, which you use your software to support that process. And the software writes the report, which reflects all of that sequential information. So they're all together. And the basis is the Internet and Home Inspection Standards of Practice. That's where you begin. Yeah. So uh, there's the components of the heating and cooling system. Everything's good. A lot of pictures. We've already seen all these pictures. I don't put all of them in the report, but I do provide all of the pictures to my clients. So we've seen all these things. There's the manifold. Cool system. And there's the defects, right? I figured I'd, I'd take a picture and put the pictures of the problems. That And hot water tank and there's electrical and there's electrical panel and then the structure put some pictures of the inspection restrictions no structural problems got the sump pump remember that the garage remember the garage garage doors gfci protection let's see here's the laundry room remember laundry room so whenever there's a problem like everything is black text on white, right? And the blue, it could be a link, but since it's a PDF, it, it, it's just the chapter or the section heading or headings or subheadings. But whenever there's something that I want my client to see, I have it in caps, in red, italicized, right? I want to get their attention. I don't want to like hide. I don't pull any punches, so to speak. It's a phrase, meaning I make my report um, less important, less alarming, less noticeable when there's a problem. A lot of real estate agents want home inspectors to kind of like tone it down. You know, don't, you know, don't write in red, right? No, I write in red. 
<laughs> I want my client to know you've got a fire hazard here, right? Uh, I don't pull any punches. I don't soften my inspection report. I don't patty cake the inspection report. So even this, right? The improvement of this attic access, do you remember that? It wasn't insulated or, or air sealed. I'll put it in the report, not in the summary, because it's like improvement. Like you, the homeowner could do it. A correction is like you have to hire somebody to do it. An improvement is like uh, changing the air filter or changing the batteries in the smoke detector. Um, and monitoring is just a regular thing. So it's like, you know, it's severity. You would, if you need a professional, it really is correction. Further evaluation and correction by professionals needed. If you can improve it yourself. Maybe a homeowner could do it. Maybe maybe you need to hire a contractor to do it, but there's the kitchen there. So it's in the way that you phrase it. And if you wanted to um, use definitions that are common to the home inspection industry, Internet actually has a, a dictionary, an online dictionary. You can use that dictionary. I might as well show you where it is. Let's go here. Remember, natchiorg slash gallery is where the gallery of illustrations are. And if you go to natchiorg slash glossary, natchiorg slash glossary, and type up, uh, search for defect, the word defect. And you have four types of defects that pop up. Cosmetic, minor, major, and material. And material is actually defined here and also in the home inspection standards of practice itself. So there's the interior and a little thing about um, my client not being with me. I wrote, we prefer to have our clients walk with us during the entire inspection for a few reasons, including we can answer all of your questions and address all your concerns as they come up, right? If you're not here, ugh, I hate having an evening phone call. We both can see the condition of the property at the time of the inspection. We're both there. I can tell my client, remember when we were looking in the basement and there were all those cardboard boxes up against the foundation wall? Remember that? I can elaborate on what may be complicated or technical. Um, you know, there's two valves at the, at the water coming in. Why, why are there two? When do I use both or should I just use one? So I kind of like that. I like to tell them why I really wanted them to be there. And then some illustrations. These are really bad illustrations, terrible illustrations that I used 20 years ago. <laughs> so go to, go to the gallery of Internet. And then here's the conclusion, a little paragraph. Um, and then a pre-closing walkthrough paragraph and um, 10 things to do as soon as they move in. And there's a table of contents and there's a letter for the seller. And we left a letter on our letterhead for every seller to read. And it says that we understand a home inspection can be a stressful process. Open up with something, some empathy, right? During our inspection, we make every effort to respect your home and leave it as we found it. All of our inspectors wore indoor only shoes, yada, 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 yada. And we try to put everything back because indoor only shoes is really important. No one wants to see a contractor walk in with muddy boots, right? So that's about it. That was our home inspection training class. And uh, let's see, it started about almost two and a half hours ago. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm Ben Gramico from Internachi. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And this has been a live, free, online, interactive Internachi webinar. And you can find that webinar at nachi.org slash webinars. I'll see you at the next webinar. Say, stay safe and healthy, everyone. Bye.